Uh, next up, we have Tyler Cody. Uh, Dr. Tyler Cody is a assistant research professor at the Virginia Tech National Security Institute. He has a PhD in systems engineering from the University of Virginia uh, and previously um, interned at NASA Glenn Research Center. Uh, his research has focused on system design for learning algorithms and transfer learning. And today he's going to be talking about the interrelatedness between machine learning algorithms and the systems they reside in and what that means for our understanding of them. Uh, Tyler, over to you. Uh, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm an academic, I guess one of the ones writing those good papers that aren't useful. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, actually, there's a lot of papers I put in the bottom here, and I encourage if there's some technical, because I'm going to go through a lot of different topics if you, you look at them. Um, and <clears throat> I think uh, probably it's not the first principles that are wrong with those papers, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, the title of the talk is about bringing reliability and prognostics to machine learning, um, but in challenging the ways in which we do that, I end up talking about some deeper issues. Um, and so this whole talk really, and, and a lot of research that I'm doing is spurred from an observation that machine learning and engineered systems are coupled. Um, and, and really further that reliability, prognostics, a lot of the stuff that we'd like to be able to do uh, can't be dissociated from the system that machine learning operates within. Um, I understand that's an extreme statement <laughs> and now it's my job with the rest of the talk to try to, you know, try to convince you of that. Um, and but at a high level, what I'm talking about doing is using system principles and systems theory to first try to understand how machine learning relates to systems. So just a general synthesis of connecting the machine learning research, machine learning ideas to the broader body of systems research, um, as well as uh, integrating machine learning and, and understanding the levels of abstraction in machine learning. I mean, typically we want some input-output kind of functionality, like give me an image and I'll tell you something about that image. But of course, there's a lot of underneath the surface in, in, in developing the solution method. So it's important to consider that uh, when we think about uh, reliability and prognostics as well. So I want to be abundantly clear. Um, I'm literally talking about machine learning as a component here um, that's sitting inside of a system that may be operating in various contexts. And I'm going to sort of make the claim that machine learning and AI researchers narrowly scope their research around the learning component almost always around the learning algorithm, um, and maybe sometimes the data that goes into that algorithm. That would be like, um, you know, really great. And, and when the machine learning researchers do that, then they say, oh, we're learning in context. But they don't have any system model typically. They don't consider um, uh, the, the actual uh, use case of that system and so forth. So what I'm advocating for is a focus on the uh, relationship between learning algorithms and their systems. Okay, so different focus, um, broader scope, and there's a proposition that comes with this, which is that engineering intelligence, which is what we're looking from, from machine learning, um, requires focusing on learning systems and not the problems that learning systems solve. Okay. Um, I really mean that literally, that systems aren't problems. Um, to try to understand that, if that you know, doesn't make sense, is like if I define a system as a relation on sets or as a relationship between parts that form a whole, it's somehow clarifying as to what it means to be a system. But I, I had to find a problem as a relation on sets. It doesn't really specify anything about the problem at all. Okay, pro problems occur at a much lower level of abstraction uh, than systems. And so if we take the lens of problems when we view learning, uh, the principal concerns of systems engineers are at least secondary. Okay, because we have to translate from problems to systems. Oh, okay, this is what they meant. And so perhaps there are different principles, first principles we would come up with if we started from systems. And considering that most of the time we want to do top-down engineering uh, to get what we uh, want to get, um, it's pretty important to try to figure out what those principles could be. Uh, so I want to call to the systems engineering V. I pulled this from some materials MITRE had. Uh, the basic process is we define our, the system, define our requirements. Uh, we decompose that all the way down to components. We specify functional requirements on those components. And then we integrate and test into a subsystem and then into the system. And then we deploy operations, maintenance, et cetera. Um, and so what I'm saying is machine learning is, is down here. It's a component. Um, but my claim in this talk is that really we can't begin reliability or prognostics in earnest until we're at least in the subsystem. And there's a stronger claim, which is, you know, it, it's a claim. It's not really the truth. But that we couldn't even begin to get to the system level. Um, and uh, so. It's on me to, do, to evidence this, and, and I understand that. Uh, but I do want to 
take a step back and try to draw some parallels between existing understandings of reliability and prognostics and machine learning uh, as a basis uh, for drawing comparison. So on the pro uh, reliability side, I'm just going to cast it as a stateless problem where typically we're looking at trying to figure out what's the wear curves of various physical components um, in relationship to various physical measurements we can take, like temperature, rotation speed, pressure, force, et cetera. Um, so we can have an understanding, okay, we have this physical component. Depending on what conditions it undergoes over its life cycle, what's the rate at which it's going to degrade and then can no longer do what we want it to do? In machine learning, we don't have physical degradation. I mean, maybe the bits or something like that, but that's not really what we're talking about when we're talking about machine learning degrading. Um, it's something more abstract, like projecting an operating envelope over a stochastic process. And what I mean by that is we have some training data here. I've, I've started. Um, and there's some target data that we want to operate on. And the question is, is that data within our envelope or is it outside the envelope? It's as simple as that. And uh, the good news for us is, um, from academia, but nonetheless, we do have first principles that tell us the similarity between the training data and test data does correlate uh, to the error on that test data, in particular to the upper bound on the error. So it's not that strong. But when we try to use physics to do things like to find the wear curves, we're using first principles of physics. We can use the first principles of learning theory to understand uh, these operating envelopes and the role that similarity metrics between the data um, um, play in letting us define those. Okay, go going to prognostics, so PHM is prognostics and health management. Prognostics being predicting when things are going to break, basically, and health management being the, what are we going to do about it. On the traditional side, we have physical and data-driven uh, models of the health of the state. It's uh, pretty straightforward there. And I'd like to say we have the same thing, but for something like transfer distance. Um, we can use these similarity metrics, say, given digital models that have some physics associated with them or given the data we have. So there's some similarities. On maintenance, I, I personally think about like the three R's of repair, rebuild, and replace. And on machine learning, we also have similar parallels. We can fine tune our model, uh, for example, like updating our prior once we collect a little bit of data from the field. So just a slight change. That's similar to repairing. Um, then there's rebuilding, which I relate to transfer learning, which is we have a model that we train to do something else, and we want to reuse that to do a new thing. We know we're going to need to make some changes, um, but we, we want to do our best to reuse it. So I think that's rebuilding, and then all the way to replacing is just retraining from scratch. So we have these relationships, existing relationships. Great. Uh, none of them touch on what I refer to as the entanglement of the machine learning AI and the systems that they operate in. Okay, so in all, the, both those previous slides, no, I didn't talk about anything about the system. Okay, so. If there's a thesis uh, in this talk today, it's that um, the physical, the adversarial, and the cognitive, this is machine learning, um, parts of our system go hand in hand with each other, and that any, way, uh, any other way of breaking down the problem makes an unjustified assumption about the existence of an independent variable. Strong claim. I, I have some cases I want to walk through to try to justify that, but if that's true, there's several implications. On the reliability side, it means that uh, any non-trivial measures of robustness from machine learning that happen in a vacuum are basically meaningless. Sure, it's great to know, like the computer science drops, it's great to know that the basic interfaces or the basic timings work out. But what does it really tell you that you perform well on the data that's very similar to the data you trained on? Like that you're, that you're in this isolated box in the lab, basically. I mean, it's great as a sanity check, but isn't that just the basic functional requirement we're expecting from the machine learning model? Um, is that really a bar at all? Uh, on PHM, it's a little bit more nuanced, and, I, and I'm going to go into this further. But basically, uh, like the gentleman asked in, in the question section for the last talk, <laughs> maintenance changes which change uh, this, the system where machine learning is being used change the dynamics of that system. In other words, the sensor data looks different, and to the machine learning, <laughs> And, you know, that's going to break it. Basically, its assumptions are no longer valid about, say, even something as simple as what are the ranges going to be? What's, what's the latitude being zero mean? Uh -huh. um, and then lastly, in test and evaluation, just because we're here, I threw this one in. But basically, what I'm saying is it depends on system state. So that, I mean, if you want to sum it up really shortly, I just really think you need system state when you're thinking about test and evaluation. Um, and there really are strong limits to what we can do left of launch. And so we carefully want to pick, you know, where do we put that effort? Um, <clears throat> okay, so 
I want to go through some what I think are compelling, but maybe end up being very academic, <laughs> uh, uh, examples that uh, I've seen in my research of this kind of linking. And all of them have the flavor of something happens in the system, and it causes machine learning to fail. And it's not something we would have detected by looking at cross-validation. Uh, or, uh, you know, 80-20 splits, or 70-20-10 splits, or whatever you have in mind. <clears throat> so th this is a most elaborate example. This is based on my dis dissertation work. We had a hydraulic actuator, uh, the kind you might find aboard a, a, a subsurface vehicle. And we, we were collecting failure data. So we simulated various faults on it. Uh, we deconstructed it and rebuilt it and re-simulated the faults. And what we found was the data looked a lot different. So these are just two Gaussian mixture models, basically clusters of the data. The red is the original, it's underneath, and the blue on top is the data after the rebuild. Um, and here, uh, what you can see is just the larger variance. Uh, the two clusters are based on the rotation direction of the actuator. Um, but the, the, the more interesting thing is, okay, so there is this change. And then if we look, so this is just the sensor data, this likelihood distribution, so the sensor data. If we look at the posterior, in other words, we say, what's the probability that the, the data, I mean, the machine is healthy given this sensor data? That changes as well. And it, it changes differently for different kinds of failure modes. So here's the opposing load failure. Okay, it looks like this. And here's the external load failure. It doesn't really matter what the difference is, but they're both load failures. They both change a different degree. And if we look across uh, various failure modes, um, here we had two load failures, two bypass valve failures. The metric here is the Hellinger distance, which uh, when it equals zero, the distributions completely overlap. And when it's one, the distributions don't overlap at all. And so what you can see in the, the furthest left column um, is the posterior distributions are changing a lot. Like when we get down to the leak valve, it, it changed by 0.88. So 88% of the distribution no longer overlapped with the pre-rebuild uh, system. There's a few takeaways to draw from this. Um, the first is something happened in the system, it caused machine learning to fail, and you wouldn't have known that that was gonna happen before you actually did the rebuild and, and saw that. Uh, so you wouldn't be able to find that at the component level. Another thing though is, you notice like, if you look at this, in the, in the middle column, the bypass valve has point two, roughly, and the leak valve has 0.75 difference. I mean, that's a normalist difference, but they're both valve failures, and why is that happening? So one path to addressing this is to go on the physical side and say there's something wrong with the design of these machines, and maybe we could change them to help the machine learning system so that the learning problem is easier. So it's easier to generalize our model across changes to that system. So that's a design question. And on operations, we can also say a similar thing. Uh, maybe if we maintain the system different, if we actually had a more tedious, let's say, uh, rebuild procedure, the system wouldn't be so different. And just as a, a story, it, it's not in the paper, but we did try to track this down in our research, and what we narrowed it down to was the vibration signals were changing a lot, and we think those vibration signals were changing a lot because we found the tensions of the fasteners changed a lot. Uh, I'm laughing because to solve this problem algorithmically requires something like cumulative lifelong transfer learning, something bordering general levels of intelligence, maybe a decade of research or something like that. Or it's a very simple requirement on the maintenance procedure that the technician checks the tensions of the fasteners. I mean, that should be kind of shocking in a way that, that you know, that there's an extremely simple caveman-like fix to the problem that some people might pitch as like a billion dollar research question. If we don't expand our scope when we're considering test and evaluation, uh, then the remedies for our failures uh, uh, are going to get lost in the details. This exact same thing applies to computer networks, and this is something we're working on right now. Whether you are an intrusion detection, okay, you being an AI ML system, whether you're an intrusion detection system, whether you're a penetration testing system, or whether you're an adversary attacking a system, in all cases, when you spur some kind of change in that network, for example, you detected someone's in your network, so then you say, okay, someone's here, we need to do something. Or you're doing penetration testing, and you say, okay, I, now I should, based on the results of that, I should put sensors here or there. Or when you're attacking a network, and you know, they find out you're in there. Um, in all cases, the network's reconfigured, and the assumptions that, as an AI ML, that you had about that network are invalidated, roughly. I mean, 
all of a sudden there's firewalls and sensors and, and, and maybe even the whole state has gone from, you know, to some kind of alert level where the normal relationships you saw between the actions and the observations you're getting back are not the same as you're seeing now. And so there's a self-destructive nature to artificial intelligence that is underappreciated, whether it's in maintenance, where AI informs a maintenance decision, they do that maintenance and it breaks the AI, or it's in uh, defense and, and, and uh, design of computer networks, where penetration testing tells us, oh, how should we reconfigure our network? We do that, and all of a sudden, the penetration testing doesn't work anymore. Uh, this is a big issue and um, an ongoing subject of research. Now, another thing, uh, this adversary thing doesn't go away. Um, when we're in an iterated game with adversaries, they can learn about us and then uh, basically learn how to evade us to go as far as even re-engineering exactly what our classifier looks like. Um, we've, so I, I've done this in credit card fraud, and the, the basic setting is we have the defender and the adversary sharing the environment, and then through that environment, they can influence each other. So in this case, uh, the fraudster is generating fake transactions, submitting those to the transaction pool. The detector, so the credit card company, is looking at those and classifying them, and then the fraudster knows whether they got caught or not, did they slip through or not, and they can use that in the next round of the game to adjust their strategy. So I mentioned operating envelopes earlier for AI as a model of reliability. If you're sitting in the center of your operating envelope in an adversarial setting, the longer you sit there, the longer the adversary can learn about you. So actually being very stable and in the center of your operating envelope might actually be a vulnerability um, in adversarial settings. So it's not clear that reliability in the traditional sense of, oh, I can operate in all the conditions, you know, I operate in with the same performance. Um, is, should be a, a goal because if we are doing that, to some extent, our optimality can be exploited. Um, a last one that's a little bit more, or maybe less new, I don't even know, but the changes in use are pretty important. Um, this, is a vi this would be a very academic formulation of the problem because we're just starting it. But we looked at rotations in the image angles, in, in this case in using MNIST. And the idea is, say, you know, you're collecting overhead imagery, but now you're flying east to west instead of north to south or something like that. And um, what we found is when you rotate the angles, the more you rotate, the lower the accuracy goes. Obviously, a systematic bias that we should you know, address in further iterations, uh, but that's not the point here. <laughs> the point is that oh, also we have a metric here um, related to coverage that um, shows us that uh, it's really some key interactions that define our performance. And if, so, so let me try to unpack this a little bit because it's kind of interesting. So at rotation angle 45, the average performance was only 44%. But on images that had that key interaction, like we'd seen that key interaction, the image just looks different, um, the accuracy was closer to something like 60%. And on images that didn't have that key interaction, the accuracy dropped below 20%. So the average was 44 but really, there's this massive underperformance um, on data that doesn't have key interactions from our training set. I represent it here with percent difference, so these 60, 67, 63% difference. That means that you know, with this metric, you can pick out images where we expect a totally different performance profile. Um, so the changes in use um, can lead to failures that we don't expect, even when they're trivial. There is some hope we can catch those kinds of things, um, but overall, it's you know, it's a pretty, a pretty daunting challenge for the T&E community, say, to imagine what all the changes, uh, you know, could be, what, what the different use cases could be, and then how we should actually test for them. Um, and so, what do we do about this? I really don't have a, a great answer, because it's certainly an interdisciplinary problem. Um, and where my specialty lies is in systems engineering and systems theory. And my basic approach, so far, is, <clears throat> is to try to model uh, learning as an input-output system. So uh, in systems theory, we have input output models for basically everything. We put these together in what are called meta models, and then we can do model-based systems engineering. I think this is a dream of the digital transformation. Uh, we can just be digitally re-engineering and doing all this stuff. Well, if we don't scope machine learning from this abstract, you know, general kind of thing to just an input output system with specific functions it has to satisfy, uh, it's going to be hard to, to, to integrate machine learning with those digital models. And what I'm representing here is simply uh, walking down the chain. So it's input-output. 
part of the inputs are the data it's trained on, and then the inputs it's going to receive later to produce its outputs. And if you go again uh, and so forth, you can break that down. So let me just do that quickly with a, a, U, a UAV example, a crude one, but um, tangible nonetheless. Let's say that we're, we're want, we want to be able to take in sensor data, um, sensor reading, say GPS and radar, and then determine a flight path. So at the input-output level, you know, this is what we have. And say we're going to train on sensor flight path pairs. Um, when I'm talking about levels of abstraction and thinking about where we want to put, say, test and evaluation or, or think about reliability, this is what I'm talking about. To a stakeholder, maybe this is all they can specify. Um, and then you go down a level to like the project manager who says, okay, we're going to use support vector machines. And, and that, so that's going to be our algorithm to support the, the kernel trick method, if, if you're aware. Um, and in doing that, we specify the hypotheses to be half spaces. Doesn't matter what that means. It's just there is a layering to these assumptions. So we can go down a layer further. Ah, I have some typos too. Um, and we can specify the algorithm. So uh, in this case, we might use the hinge loss or, or a, linear, a linear program to do the optimization. So there's a layering to all of these uh, assumptions we make. When you say, oh, I want to use deep learning or I want to use this particular architecture, you've made assumptions across all of these layers. Uh, but if you come top down on it and think about what am I actually trying to engineer here, um, I think that the question of how does the system relate to what I'm trying to engineer here is a lot more obvious. And this also, apply, this also applies uh, for the more theoretical stuff. So unsupervised, supervised learning, I think sits at just specifications on the data, like does it have labels or not. Um, empirical risk minimizations from learning theory, and that has to do with what your uh, search problem is looking like, um, and so forth. So this theory I'm developing is, is well integrated with machine learning and learning theory. And you know, getting to the very academic kind of crazy stuff is to say, OK, if learning is a system, what's different about doing things like composition? We want to put two learning systems together, or we want to put a learning system together with a traditional component. Um, how can we understand that? And uh, there's a word being thrown around like semantic uh, composability as opposed to syntactic composability. Like, is it meaningful to compose these things together versus is composition just making sure the interfaces and timings line up? And uh, it, it's not worth going into too much detail, but there are compositions, say, transfer learning, we're sharing knowledge. That's not just a simple series or parallel composition. Okay, so um, the hope is uh, translating machine learning into systems theory uh, can give us a better, better un uh, understanding of first principles for engineering systems that have machine learning. Okay, I have no idea how I'm doing on time, but this is the conclusion. Okay, the main takeaway, if there's anything, is that machine learning needs prognostics and health management. I really hope I was able to convey that at least. Um, and uh, and I, I would like, you know, it'd be great if you could also think a little bit about how these physical changes, or how the fa you know the fact that we try to defend our systems or that people are attacking our systems, uh, influence this process. Um, I'm growing to feel that machine learning needs PHM certainly whenever the system undergoes like deliberate large physical changes. Um, but I also think that applies to the cyber world as well, um, even if there's not a strong physicality involved there. Um, so uh, 